Hi, I'm Josh McGrath. I'm Andrew Haas. And this is the Ardent Pursuit Podcast. Welcome back. Today's episode is titled, Dating Shouldn't Change Everything. Now, for some of you, it's probably going to be a little controversial, so buckle up. In our last episode, we examined what is the purpose of the dating phase, and we actually used this analogy of, you know, you're flying somewhere and you've got a layover at a terminal. And the purpose of the dating phase is not to set up shop in that terminal, right? That's a, that's a place you're passing through, ultimately, to your destination. And so today what we want to do is talk and examine what does life look like when you're kind of in that terminal, you know, waiting phase, so to speak, when you're in that dating phase. Um, because there are many cultural assumptions I think we bring to the table when it comes to romantic relationships, and not all of them are healthy or helpful. So, Andrew, let's dive in here. If, so for the vast majority of people, there's this cultural assumption, say, that when you begin a dating relationship, everything or a lot of things in your life should change. Um, but we're going to challenge that thinking. Yeah, it's easy to think that because we are now being intentional about our pursuit of one another, that means that we have to be intentional about changing everything else in our life as a result. So things will change, mm -hmm. and that's good. Sure. Um, you know, by definition, yep. what we want to discuss and bring attention to is that not everything needs to change, and certainly there isn't this, say, new normal that yeah. is established. Yes, because now that you're dating, obviously she holds a place of value in your life but she's not the thing of value in your mm -hmm. life. And it's important to note, we're talking about the dating phase right now. Obviously, once you're married, she is the thing of value in your life. But I think for a lot of men, you know, in their excitement to pursue her, you know, they, they fall, you know, head over heels in love. They oftentimes make her the only thing of value in their life. And all the other things that were healthy and helpful, they put on the back burner and forget to pursue altogether. So what are some of the cultural assumptions that could likely be influencing us? So there are many, um, and we, we've noted a few here, um, but I think one of them that comes to mind right away is this idea of you know, trying to be romantic um, and trying to you know, romance her. Mm -hmm. um, and that can look many different ways, and we've, I forget which episode we talked about this, uh, but the goal of, of dating is not to be romantic. Uh, again, that's gonna be controversial. Um, put that on a t-shirt. Uh, sell it at Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the goal isn't to be romantic. Uh, another thing here, physical touch and intimacy, which we covered a mm -hmm. couple episodes ago. Um, you know, the goal isn't to suddenly, now that we're dating, completely change our physical interaction with one another. Yeah, or that physical intimacy should even be introduced. There, I would say there's a default assumption that when you start dating, there are now new norms. Yep that are acceptable or should happen around physical touch and time spent together. Definitely. Another one that comes to mind is like emotional codependency, mm -hmm. which is not something we tend to talk about as a culture until it gets to a point where it's like actually unhealthy. So specifically with emotional codependency, I think that could be unclear for people mm -hmm. um, what that actually looks like. Um, how would that play out? Yeah, so uh, you could devote an entire episode to this. Um, there are probably multiple books written on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, but briefly, particularly when I think about like the dating phase and things I've observed over you know the last two decades, I think one of the things that is most notable about emotional codependency is the fact that your emotional state and stability as a man is dependent upon her emotional state or stability. Mm. And so as her emotions rise or fall, so do your emotions and your bandwidth to handle pressure, to handle weight, to be able to engage with the culture around you, to be able to engage with family and friends and community. Yeah, well said. Another cultural assumption would be extended time alone. Mm -hmm. And again, I think there is a default approach to now that we're dating, we now should spend extended time alone. Yep. We've unpacked that idea before mm -hmm. in, in some previous episodes. And I know we have an upcoming episode where we're actually going to talk about that in depth because I think most people are very influenced by that idea. Um, and not just individually, but even kind of community, family, friends, oftentimes 
encourage it and actually steer couples towards that idea of like, you've got to spend time alone together. And I would even say it's become part of the definition, meaning to date means you spend alone time mm. with that person. Yeah. Um, that's just become one and the same yep. when you think of people dating. Yes. Um, but I would suggest, I'm sure you would suggest that when you date, significant or extended time alone actually doesn't need to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. It might eventually, but especially sure. early on, does not need to be part of it. No, not at all. Which leads to kind of a, a final cultural assumption, which is this idea of constantly being available for one another um, with your time, with your energy, um, you know, whether it's in person or via phone or text. Um, this idea that like you're now essentially codependent. Maybe you're not emotionally codependent, but like you're codependent as far as just life. Yeah, and I mean that's I think made much worse, or that's been magnified with the advent of cell phones and you know social media now. Mm -hmm. I remember you know flip phones and cell phones were just becoming a thing back when I was of dating age, and the phone really disrupted that idea that you could be contacted anytime, yep. uh, any day of the week, mm -hmm. any hour of the day. And when I was dating then, there was this expectation. Um, there was this just assumption I had that, yeah, I could call her any time of the day, mm. any hour of the night, sure. and vice versa, and I should be available for her and vice versa. Yep. And that was just an assumption I had. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing saying, yeah, that's normal, or that should be. Yeah. I mean, think about today just kind of in terms of texting in general, forget romantic relationships. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't count the number of texts that I send out in a week where it starts with, Hey, sorry for the delay. <laughs> and it's like a few hours or maybe a day. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I feel so guilty that they texted me and multiple hours have gone by and I haven't responded. Um, it's just kind of like a cultural assumption that we have that we're all available 24 seven immediately at the drop of a hat to respond to each other's needs, particularly when it comes through text because texting is a, a non-invasive way of communicating. But in reality, it's like, well, no, we, we can't be available 24-7. Um, and particularly in a romantic relationship, it, it actually becomes very unhealthy in the dating phase. Um, and actually, even in marriage, to constantly be like, my entire lifetime and world revolve around you. Um, and so one of the things that we've got to be asking is, are any of these cultural assumptions helpful in determining whether I should be moving towards covenant or not covenant. None of these behaviors or habits actually help determine that. They're all just in the moment, short term, what I'm feeling, what I think is the right thing. Mm -hmm. But actually none of them play toward long-term success. And I think these things actually end up causing people to stay in the dating phase longer because feels good, you know, it's meeting, you know, emotional needs, it's meeting physical needs, it's, it's, it's meeting a lot of those relational desires, all without committing to the other person in covenant. And so it's kind of that idea of like, you, you've arrived at your layover at the terminal, and you're like, hey, I, I love this club lounge. Man, the food here is good. The drink is awesome. It's comfortable and cozy. Yeah, I think I just want to stay here for the next year or three or eight. Yeah, you're and not. like that's weird, right? Like, but no, move move to a destination. Either go home or get to where you're headed. Well, I think there is a direct parallel there because the more comfortable you are in an environment, mm -hmm. the lounges make it not a bad place to hang out. It's true. You could spend more time there and not actually feel like, oh, I should move on. You're absolutely right. Because back when I used to travel, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I hated layovers. I'm like, get me to my final destination. Layovers are so uncomfortable. I hate sitting in those stupid chairs. Everything costs so much money at the airport. Whereas now when I travel, because I have access to lounges, I, I'm like booking travel where I'm stopping at a lounge on my way to my final destination. I'm trying to make sure I've got at least 90 minutes because I really want to enjoy that lounge experience. Mm -hmm. um, and how much more so do people do that today in a dating relationship? And I think of physical touch and extended time alone together as that equivalent of the airport lounge. When you experience physical touch with somebody or you spend extended time with them, there is a sense of satisfaction um, that actually will make it harder for you to move past that. You're more likely and, and more willing to stay where you are mm -hmm. because you're kind of content and happy with how things are going. The dating phase 
actually has a tension that, that men need to manage between what you're feeling and what is actually wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, because what you're feeling is, I want to do all these things. And, and a lot of the cultural assumptions are things that you will do in marriage, but they're not necessarily wise for you when you're dating. And something that men really need to reckon with is the desire to do something and acting on that desire. Mm. And that's a lifelong thing. Sure. But specifically in this dating phase, it's really important that men come to terms with, I have these desires, I have these strong desires, Mm -hmm. but I don't act on them. Yeah. There's a very good chance that you don't act on them, even a little bit. Yeah. The the, the existence of a desire says nothing to whether you should act on it. Self-control and restraint. It's so important that in this season specifically that men practice this. There is an idea that if you're in a healthy relationship, then it will look like the physical touch. It will look like time spent alone together. Um, It will look like being available to one another 24-7. But that actually isn't the fruit of a good or healthy relationship. So that's been the cultural definition of it. Those are all markers of dating as culture defines it. Sure. But we are suggesting that dating, as we suggest, looks very different. Yeah, we, we expect that hopefully the man is you know head over heels in love with the woman. Better be. Ho- hopefully he's obsessed with her on some level. Um, but like you said, that he's got to have self-restraint. He's got to have self-control. And his feelings will grow for her as they're dating. But that doesn't mean that externally you're going to see those represented in a lot of you know physical demonstrative ways. Um, it, it, the best way to externally demonstrate it is to move towards covenant and to propose. And I would say that the defining, a defining characteristic of a man of stature is the ability to have strong feelings mm-hmm. toward, could be a lot of things, but having strong feelings toward a woman and not acting on them. So many men, have great ideas in mind for how they're going to walk out a a relationship. And then they get in a relationship and they forget all of those great ideas um, because either their emotions take over or the sexual desire they have takes Mm -hmm. over and suddenly they're, they're influenced by something other than their great plan, their great idea that they put together with how they were gonna walk out that relationship. And there are four things that we want to unpack, you know, pitfalls that men tend to fall into Mm -hmm. when they're in a romantic relationship. Um, And the first one is is this idea that uh, your attention, your focus, and your energy becomes fixated on her needs, on her emotions, on her stability, on how she's doing, and you end up stepping into an unhealthy role as like a pretend husband almost, um, all without having committed to her in covenant. There's a natural desire within most healthy women to want a husband in their life. The problem is, as dating starts and progresses, that desire in her is going to increase, Mm -hmm. and the desire to fulfill that role from the guy is also going to increase. The problem is when you start to act on it. She has certain desires, and you have the desire to meet that. And as you said, it's a pretend husband, though. It's not the right time. It's not the right place. That will come eventually if things work out. Yep. But for now, the guy needs to really understand if you have the desire for something, yeah. it might not be the time to act on it. Yes. And it's so important for men to recognize and remember that it is not their role to become her emotional support. Mm-hmm. Um, that's going to be controversial. Mm-hmm. That's probably going to ruffle some feathers. But it is, you know, if she's a believing woman, it is her job to rely on the Lord and the Holy Spirit to be her support. Um, she needs to go to older, married, healthy women in her life and rely on them for emotional support. She needs to turn to healthy, mature friends and rely on them for emotional support. And where where you end up with so many, you know, a toxic, dysfunctional, weird relational dynamics is when a man tries to step into the role of being her emotional support, which is not a role he's called to or even can fulfill. You know, if I had this material when I was a college student, I probably would have fared much better. Mm -hmm. Um, Back to when I was in the dating scene, there was a particular woman 
who I would give her my attention any time of day. If she was having a bad day, having a great day, yep. um, I needed to hear about it. Sure. <laughs> and that creates a drag on, it feels good in the moment, Yep. right? But like, because there's like a draw in you and it feels like she needs you and you're able to bring exactly, something to her. Exactly, exactly. But over the weeks, over the months, it actually is producing the reverse of what you want. Mm -hmm. It creates this drag almost. I have to give my attention to something and giving attention there is attention I'm not giving elsewhere. Yeah, now obviously this idea is extremely controversial, but I want you to speak to it from the perspective of, of being married because what we're not saying is that a man should provide zero emotional support and should be emotionally checked out from his relationship uh, with his wife in particular here is what I'm asking you about, but also even in the dating phase. I mean. Obviously, by the near mere fact that you're in a relationship means that there's going to be an emotional, you know, element to that relationship. And particularly the closer you get, there is a, a bit of an emotional dependency. I've got friends who, when they're not doing well, I'm not like, peace out. I'm not going to emotionally be, you know, uh, uh, emotionally available to you. Um, I obviously do care. And, and, you know, the Bible talks about with weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Um, what we're talking about here, though, is 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 the emotional equilibrium mm -hmm. um, of a woman being dependent upon a man being involved in her life at every, you know, turn to make sure she's okay. Um, but in a, in a marriage, obviously, as husband with a wife, you are emotionally available. But, like, how does that look? So... With dating, you know, a lot of people approach dating as, you know, diet marriage, I've heard it said. You know, marriage That's life. That's awesome. <laughs> um, it's like, yeah, you're kind of, you're starting that journey, or it's maybe the same thing, has a similar flavor, but it's not, it's not the real thing. Sure. Um, but I would suggest that dating actually is not a young, early marriage. Mm -hmm. And so one of the common critiques of dating is, well, if I don't do it now, or if he doesn't do it now, how will I know he'll do it in marriage? Or if, if there's not this sure. now, what if it's not there? And my, my position on this is that dating, at least early on, should bear very little resemblance to marriage. Yeah. Um, should bear more resemblance to singleness. Yes. And again, you have desires. Those desires will be acted on in marriage. Yep. And the fact that you're not acting on them now in the dating phase, that says nothing to how things will be in marriage. Sure. And understanding that there's a stark difference, um, you know, you can talk about sex specifically. I firmly advocate no sex before marriage. Um, I do think that is the best way to walk this out. Yeah. And so just because you're not having sex before marriage... Doesn't mean you're not a whole person. Yes. Nor does it mean no sex will happen within marriage. Sure. Right? That's silly. Yeah. And so we have to carry that to a much broader set of ideas. Yeah. There are things that you will do, there are things you're not do in the dating phase um, that bear no resemblance in marriage. So I would just want to clear that up. I think people have this, have this idea that, again, dating in some form is supposed to start to resemble marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should mirror marriage. Yeah. So in marriage, a husband does have the responsibility to ensure that his wife grows in emotional health. Now... That responsibility starts at marriage, though. Does not start in mm -hmm. the dating phase. But what happens is often, I think, guys start to feel that desire and it's probably reciprocated and we act on that prematurely. Which brings us to pitfall number two here, which is you become you know, inseparable with one another. And, and mm -hmm. I think that was beautifully said. One of the reasons why people become inseparable is because they're like emotionally dependent upon one another. Mm -hmm. um, and so suddenly their schedule their life. They can't go anywhere without the other person. You invite the bro over to watch a movie or play a game and he's like, well, let, let me check in, you know, with my girl just to see, you know, what she's up to or, or worse. He, he's asking her permission if, if he can go out with the guys. Um, I mean, there's an emasculated man for you. Ooh, gross. Not coming to your wedding. Um, so it's like, yeah, like men need to recognize mm -hmm. that they, are, they aren't inseparable. Mm -hmm. That they are still very much independent, mm -hmm. still single. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care if you're in a relationship. You're single until covenant. Mm -hmm. Biblically, you are single till covenant. Mm -hmm. um, and so for men, they've got to avoid the trap of, of saying, I have to be, you know, constantly available to the girl that I'm pursuing. And I think it's worth 
restating this idea that spending time together is not a definition of dating. Mm -hmm. It is a cultural assumption at this point. Yes. It has become the norm, the default approach for, I would say, most people. But we're actually challenging that assumption. Yes. And one of the ways that we see this worked out is you've got men who aren't able to attend social functions or go out alone anymore. They always have to have her as they go out or she always has to have him. Um, they're not able to just commit to hanging out with friends until they find out what she's doing first and what is her schedule. Mm -hmm. um, or dysfunctional alert, um, they actually have to get permission. Oh, gross. There's a beta male for you. Um, they've got to get permission mm -hmm. from her before they commit to hanging out with the bros. Um, why? Because they're inseparable. They're living like they're one, even though they're still very much single. Because guess what? Reality check, until you've said, I do, until you've entered into covenant, you are still single regardless of what culture says about your relationship. It's really important for people to understand that things change in marriage. This is less of a scale or a spectrum yeah. where you kind of inch closer in behavior. There will be some of that. But for the most part, as you said, you're single until you're not. Mm -hmm. And so the dating phase, you're trying to figure out, am I not going to be single Essentially, yes. am I going to be married? Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on to pitfall number three, which is you're posting about her on your social media and your social media becomes all about her or you two or your life together. Just so awkward. So awkward. Like there's nothing like weirder than to see a guy who's just always posting about a girl on social media. I'm like, don't do that. Like better, don't. better. Uh, right, here's a rule of thumb. If you're going to post about her, do it like once a year. Do it on her birthday. That's a great share place the, to start. Share the appreciation. Better idea, delete your social media mm. and go outside. There you go. There we go. You, you want to express your love yes. to her? You know, what's so interesting, if you go back like 200 years ago, how did men express their love for a woman? Mm. They, they did so through artistic endeavors. They painted pictures, right? Mm -hmm. um, they wrote music. Um, mm -hmm. they, they wrote sonnets. They, they wrote plays. Um, mm. they, they wrote these long letters of affection to her. And, and what was so great about that was like, we ended up with a lot of art as a result. Whereas today it's like, huh. here's a picture of her and me on the beach and she's just the best in the world because she's hot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, just don't, just don't. Like, go, go, go compose a symphony. And I will accept that as, as a proper way of expressing your love for her. Because at least with the symphony, we all benefit. <laughs> we all benefit. Yeah. The pictures you're posting, no one's benefiting from. <laughs> Except the algorithm. <laughs> Very true, actually. Um, and that brings us to finally pitfall number four here, which is, this one is a bit nuanced, and it's kind of a, a newer thing that hmm. has occurred in culture, but is your adding her to all of your text groups. Yep. Um, it's interesting. There's been this kind of like shift over the last, I don't know, five plus years um, where probably just because of how terrible social media is, a lot of people have moved to group texting and that's where they share, you know, pictures and videos and links and have discussions. Um, and they're, it's great. Uh, I know we're part of like dozens. So many. So many. Um, and what can happen is you've heard us talk about and encourage men to invite her into your community to get to know the people who know you. Mm. Um, and so one could think, oh, well, that means I have to add her to, you know, these group threads because it's a great way for her to interact with me and my friends and get to know us. Well, well the problem with that is that that probably is a little premature because until covenant happens, it's very possible that you may not end up together, at which point now you've invited her into all these threads and either they have to remove her or you have to start a whole set of new threads. And I would go so far as to say that in the context here that we're talking about, a group thread is actually not community. So yes. I think it's a false premise to suggest or think that her being invited in or being a part of that somehow meets that criteria. It's true. And, and a parallel that I know we've talked about before here with this idea is the fact that like, you know, you bring her home at Christmas time, 
your family's doing like the family Christmas picture and you're like, well, let's include her. And so mm -hmm. you take the family picture with her in it, even though she's not family yet, there's no covenant. And then it doesn't work out. So a year later, you're back home with another girl and they're taking the family Christmas picture and it's like, hey, she should be in it. So you take the family Christmas picture and she's in it and she's not family, haven't entered covenant. And suddenly what you have on the mantle are a bunch of family Christmas photos with a different girl in each one because you actually haven't committed to her through marriage. And in the same way uh, that, you know, you kind of get that digital, right, history of her mm -hmm. being involved in all these, you know, threads where it's like, oh, well, Jackie was the last one in this thread. And so we started the new one and parentheses, not Jackie. Um, <laughs> and then, oh, Betsy was added to this one. You got to start a new one, not Betsy thread. Um, and so it's like, it just becomes so weird and awkward. Like, just avoid all that. Just Don't avoid it. Yeah. Just avoid it altogether. 100%. So those are the four pitfalls that we've identified. Um, obviously, there are many more. Yeah. Um, and we have several episodes coming up, actually, where we're going to devote entire episodes to specific pitfalls. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to note that you know where you're going informs what you do. Um, and we, back in episode four, laid out kind of a framework to ask the question, what is the purpose of a romantic relationship? Because when you understand what the purpose of a romantic relationship is, that begins to inform what you're going to do next. Yeah, and even last episode, we talked about what the purpose of the dating phase is. And also, I think it was episode 10 and 11, um, you know, men are called to lead romantic relationships. So understanding kind of how you operate as mm -hmm. a leader in a romantic relationship. And, and all of these things actually ultimately help frame for men how to pursue a, a woman and ultimately trying to set them up for the best possible success. Um, that is the reason why uh, we're trying to help them understand where they're going, because that will help them understand what they're going to then do. Yeah, let's not forget, this isn't all about how to have the worst possible time pursuing a woman exactly. or make it the most boring or uninteresting. Yes, like I want you to enjoy all of it just mm -hmm. in the right place and in the right context in a way that is healthy and helpful. And what you do now really impacts how things play out later. Yeah. So as we conclude, you know, like we oftentimes do, we're going to speak to two groups of people. Number one, if you're in a relationship, we want you to take this week and examine whether anything we've discussed today exists in your relationship. One of the best ways to do this is to sit down with your authority and accountability and to ask for their input and observations. As we've said before, men cannot discern reality for themselves when they are romantically interested in a woman. And two, for those of you who are not in a relationship, we want you to do some self-reflection this week. Ask yourself what cultural assumptions regarding the dating phase have been imprinted on you and ask the question, are any of those things helpful in determining whether you should be moving towards covenant or not? As always, we love having you guys here on the podcast and we look forward to having you here next time.